This is the motion of the human heart. This kind of emotion is both a bringing together, an integration, and also a differentiation. These two motions characterize reality. And they're an index to the articulation of the double nature of man. And the double nature of man is not Jekyll and Hyde, but character and consciousness. Character and consciousness. One of the clues about character we get from the old Latin language. In the Roman Republic, the most important quality a man could have was gravitas, the substantiality, the trustworthiness of having a certain gravity to his person, to his character. Gravitas. It's the same word for which we use in contemporary astrophysics for gravity. And gravitation, gravity, gravitas, is the integral bringing together of the real. The character of a human being is brought together by this gravitas, this gravitas, this gravity, gravitation, it's the integration, it's the bringing together. And so human character is founded upon being able to bring together an enriched field, enriched as far as can be in terms of the family, the home, the education, the schooling. The whole reason why there were families and why culture is family-based was to enrich the field in which this gravitas, this gravity, this gravitation, this integration takes place. And so the character is the sum, the summation. It is the focus of integration. And one can integrate one's character. But quite distinct from that is consciousness. And consciousness does not occur at all in this character formation, in gravitas. The Greek language, radically distinct from the Latin language, the Greek language had a subtlety. It had two names for the same phenomenon and the two names were reflective of a conscious predilection rather than a character predilection. The Latin language, the old Roman character, looked toward developing a solid, substantial citizen. Whereas the Greek language looked to develop the kind of mobility that would be more attendant to the person. Integration makes character, but differentiation makes person, makes consciousness. And the person is the prism of consciousness.
This same double motion characterizes stars. We come to our one of our books, one of our legs for this stage of the journey, Timothy Ferris's Galaxies. A star to be real must have been condensed, must have been brought together by gravitation to a certain point, that point being, in fact, not a point, but a threshold. We have to watch our language here because slovenly, careless language here miscues, and instead of intelligence, we get a rote displacement. And instead of intelligence operating, what we get are little push-button cues that standard mechanical misleading threads that go together like a net of ignorance. And we need to be careful about that. In fact, it's not a point, but a threshold. And this reflectively takes us back. The word point, the fact that there is a threshold rather than a point, takes us back to the two words that the Greeks used in describing geometry, which was always the formative unfoldment structure for the conscious person. When the Greek genius developed education to the point to where they were educating consciously persons, they used geometry as the index for the unfoldment of form. And of course, the human genius who did this was Pythagoras. The Greek language used two different words for point. The first word was stigma. Stigma. And stigma is the term that Aristotle would use to designate a point. And in the Greek, stigma as a point is from a perspective of retrospection, looking back, that a point, a stigma, is the origin of the line which one is looking at. So a stigma is where the line begins. But it's not, here's the stigma, and then the line begins from there. The word stigma means that this line, if one goes back to any place that one wants to locate along the line as the beginning of the line for the purposes of discussion, that's the stigma. And of course, in later uh, high-level philosophic Greek, it became a mark of ignorance that one bears a stigma as a mark of a diseased perspective. Stigmatized. If one has a stigma in your eye, you cannot see what is there. The other word, the other Greek word for point, semia, from which we get the word seminal, it means that it is generative, a generative focus, a focus which is able to open, open out. And from a semia, from any given semia, any given point, one can then draw a line straight out. So that in Pythagoras' time, the first educational procedures 
that seriously took in the development of consciousness as well as character. We're very careful to make this kind of distinction and taught geometry from the standpoint of the semia in motion rather than from the standpoint of reductively identifying the stigma of the line. So that a Pythagorean geometry had an energy, an energized quality, whereas the Aristotelian traditional geometry had a kind of Roman gravitas to it. You could engineer very nicely with it, and you could build with stone very nicely with that sort of thing. And the Romans, like the Aristotelian Greeks, were very good engineers. And they built wonderful characters, but they did not do a very good job in terms of persons or of generating consciousness. And the whole educational modes split about 2,500 years ago in the classical West. Publicly split. we find in the dialogues of Plato the radical difference between young men who are educated by the sophists and the few young men who are educated by Socrates. Plato's dialogue, the Protagoras, is probably the world classic presentation of the difference in which protagonists, Protagoras, and we get the uh, term protagonist, uh, very similar to Protagoras. Protagoras says that man is the measure of all things, but he uses man as a stigma. He traces back the measure of all things to man. Whereas in the Socratic education, one began with a simia, a seminal idea, or your, your opinion of some seminal idea. Let's begin from there and inquire and see where this leads us. The development of the seed was the way in which Socratic education took place. And it's very difficult to proceed in this way because the very first quality that comes up is the quality of ambivalence. And the emotional sense of ambivalence in its initial quality is irony, a sense of irony. And so when you begin the geometry of learning, in the old seminal way of Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, the very first thing that comes up is that the entire process, the entire field of inquiry is tinged. That was the alchemical term. Tinged by irony. Everything is ironic. And the only way to deal naturally with Irony, in, a, in such a way consistent with the phenomenon of irony, in other words, you can ignore it and go back to some kind of a stigmatized, blocky education which taught young men to throw javelins through other young men who couldn't hold their shields to get rid of the javelins. Or taught young men to fit into the blocky structure of a culture and to make sure that all the blocks of that culture are going to stay put and not change. There's nothing dynamic about that kind of education. It produces a very solid character 
full of gravitas. But it's rather like the kinds of character that were like uh, in the uh, beginnings of the Second World War, those fortifications at Metz and various places along the, uh, the famous World War I line. They were fortifications. They were the type of human character that could not adapt to change, could not adapt to a dynamic situation. And so the German panzer commanders just simply went around these forts, these fortifications, left them in place, and blitzed the landscape. Very much the same thing that General Schwarzkopf did in the Iraq war. He let them dig in with their half million men and just simply went around them. A dynamic character is able to participate in an ambidextrous, labyrinthine situation because it has taken the ambivalence that initially occurs and registers as a sense of irony and deepens it, deepens irony, into a sense of paradox. And when irony deepens into paradox, one is faced then with a very crucial, and the word crucial comes from the same root that the alchemical term crucible comes from, comes from the same term that cross comes from, the cross that man has to bear, the crucible that has to be there, the crux of the matter, is a paradox requires for its solution a transformation. So that a dynamic sense of nature, a dynamic sense of education, understands that the integral process, whether you're talking about human beings or you're talking about stars, it's the same, it's the similar quality of the way in which reality works. A human being's maturation is very much like the way a star matures. The life cycle of a star is remarkably like the life cycle of a human being in its completeness. When a star integrates itself out of a cloud of gas, hydrogen gas, through the process of gravitation, it reaches an ambivalent state, a kind of a cosmic irony, where it doesn't know if it's a gas field or if it's some kind of a form. It doesn't know whether it's a field or a form. And this irony deepens into a paradox because the atomic structure of a field and the atomic structure of a form are radically different. And at a certain crucial threshold, not a point, not a stigma, but a semia, a generative point, the threshold where electrons can no longer stay with the atomic nucleuses that they were originally with. And when electrons are stripped off from a nucleus, other stripped nuclei, not having the electron buffers, come into direct contact and create fusion. And it's the fusion threshold that determines whether this is a gas field, a dense gas field, or whether it's a star. Now we have the sophomoric parlor imagination of the 1930s or 40s that's still around, if you can believe it, almost into the 21st century, that somehow stars are some standard imaginable thing, and that's what they are. That's a stigma. An imagination stuck in that stigmatization 
produces the kind of character that are building blocks for the next strong tyranny. The next totalitarian state will use people like that as bricks for whatever walls it wants to make, wherever it wants to make. And the next tyranny is going to be very difficult to dismantle. And so the wisest thing is not to make <laughs> the stones that they would use to make the walls that would put our descendants uh, in a very compromised situation. How to do that? We have to understand that this kind of education is indispensable. It's indispensable. And that where we are now in nature already has in its germ, in its semia, in its development, all of the issues and problems that are there right now. And I'm mixing up language about the development of human beings and language about the development of stars so that there's an ambidextrous quality, hopefully not ambivalent. If I weren't controlling uh, the developmental structure, it would be a bit ambivalent. But I'm hoping it's ambidextrous, means it can go either way. And if I keep the ambidextrousness in a uniform motion, if I keep uh, both kinds, left and right, in a motion, it produces a deepening of the ambidextrousness so that what comes out is symmetry. And symmetry in nature has the same function as paradox in the development of human beings. So when you look at books on nuclear physics and you see that the term symmetry is uh, one of the seminal ideas of mathematics, of nuclear physics, of astrophysics, we're talking about the same function as in relating to paradox in the development of human beings. Paradox calls for a transformation. Symmetry calls for a likewise transformation. The transformation in symmetry is for there to be a complementarity of the whole mediated by the dynamic character of its, uh, of its wholeness. So if there's such a thing as the dynamics of symmetry leading towards the ratio of the real. Just as in the development of human personality, a real educator as opposed to some kind of instructor who's just turning out uh, bricks for the next wall builders. A real educator looks to encourage a sense of irony, a sense of ambivalence, and to encourage the students not to get worried about this, that this is a good sign. This is the, this is the sign of health. The doctor of civilization says that when the students are feeling ambivalent in their educational process, this is a good sign. This is a sign of health. That they no longer are convinced that they know what's going on is where they should be. That they are no longer able with glib actuality to tell somebody else who's not in that situation what they're doing, this is a good sign. This is a sign then that they're beginning to learn. Not to learn something, but to participate in the learning process as it is going on, which currently at this stage is ambivalent and should be. And so if you don't know what's going on, then you're with me. You should have no idea what's going on. 
If you do, my task is to scramble that up, which I can do. But not in a Gurdjieffian rascal sort of a way, but in that kind of ancient traditional way of if you understand what's going on, then I'll enrich the field with more and more dimensions until you let go of that supposition that you do understand, so that you experience the ambivalence. Not the ambivalence to be stymied. Stymy is like stigma, a very similar kind of thing. But to be freed to wonder. And Socrates says, philosophy, the love of wisdom, begins in the sense of wonder. And until we have wondered together, there's no way that we could find out the truth about anything. Philosophy is an adventure, an excursion in inquiring together with a shared sense of wonder to find out what is going on. And there's never a lack of an issue, because if there isn't some issue that we're curious about, wondering about together, we can wonder about why there is no issue together and proceed the same way. Now, nature is the only way, it's the only matrix of change which allows for this kind of enrichment inquiry to be shareable in terms of ironic wonder. <laughs> Nature is a perfect mystery which encourages the wild and wonderful to be as true as the most mundane and stable. In nature, there's as much that's wild as there is that's stable. Nature apparently is a totally ambivalent God lover <laughs> in these qualities. She likes the stability that leads to character, and she likes the effervescence that leads to consciousness equally well. These are boy children, these are girl children, she doesn't care, they're children, they're hers. But the processes are different, and we can see that they happen at the same time. Because as the gas becomes a star, and fusion takes place on the atomic level, when two nuclei fuse together, the electrons that were originally with those nuclei have no place to go. They have no home anymore. And because they have no home, they are paradoxically <laughs> orphans. And because an electron, when it's with a nucleus, is a particle and fits into the family, which is that atom, when it is exiled, <laughs> when it is exiled, when the electron is exiled from its family atom, like Ishmael, it goes wandering <laughs> out in the desert. Out in the desert of what? Of the extra atomic reality. And instead of being a particle, instead of being a stigma within a family, it becomes a semia and becomes energy. Instead of becoming a particle, it becomes an energy wave. And because it's an energy wave, and it has no place in the brick-like structure of the atoms, <laughs> Adam's families, that's a kind of a Hollywood pun for some of you. These weird orphans are free to go wherever they want to go. And where do they go? They, as Bill Murray in Ghostbusters, uh, when they said, uh, uh, where do those stairs go? He said, well, they go up. <laughs> where do those orphaned uh, energy waves go? They go up. Why do they go up? 
because they have transformed out of particleness into waveness. I'm not even sure whether I should say wavedness. I think when Christopher Marlowe was drunk with scratching his red hair at the end of the bar, he would have said, <clears throat> wavedness when I'm drunk and waves when I'm serious. So you take your choice. I'm trying to open up here an emotional tone. An emotional tone. Why? First lesson of quantum physics, if you can imagine a picture in your mind, you've missed it. <laughs> if you have an image of heaven in your mind, you're never going to get there. If you have a graven image of God, you better repent. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how clever it is. A non-image of non-imageness. There are some John Cagey New Agers who really pride themselves that I've got it, man. I've got the perfect non-image of no image. And they teach being Zen masters on weekends to people who are bored in their office lives. Don't do that. The ancient Greek phrase was, hey! <laughs> Just like us. Don't do that. A star has orphaned energy waves bubbling up in its surface. Take our star. Our star's name is Sol, S-O-L. Sol. There's light energy bubbling up, and it takes about two million years to bubble up and reach the surface of soul. The interior of our star has this bubbling. It's, it's, like, uh, it's like carbonated matter. And the little bubbles, because God will serve no light before its time. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> I'm calmer when I uh, Manly Hall showed me how to lecture from sitting. I used to pace around and fling chalk and the whole thing. I had this wonderful education as a, as, a, as a youngster. I started at the University of Wisconsin at 17. I was very precocious. And they gave me a scholarship. And they, they said, you know, genius, go out, do all this. And, and uh, my first impressive lecture was um, the great historian, uh, William Appleman Williams who uh, uh, did many books on American history, Contours of American History, one of the greatest books on the United States. And he used to uh, have his a lecture a mic with this big, thick cord going to this mic phone uh, standing on the, uh, on the stage. And he would put his hands in his pockets, no coat, no coat, put his hands in his pockets, and William Appleman Williams would walk slowly as he was talking in this intense, confidential tone. And he would get to the very edge of the stage, and the cord would be taunt, and the mic stand would be leaning, and it would almost fall, and he would pivot suddenly. And the thing would go back, and he would say something, and you knew it was going to be on the final exam. What did he say? Did you hear him? Sidney Poitier used to speak like that when he was, did you hear him? No one would know what he had said. These were the days before tape recorders, and there he would be nudging each other, and he would be walking back slowly to the mic, already on a completely different subject, and people would be scrambled. He was getting a sense of wonder into his students, so that 
They knew he had said something important. They didn't know what it was, but it's in the damn book, right? So you have to go and read the book. He was a genius. Wonderful. And at 17, I mean, ah, no one had ever talked this way before. I'm trying to get the juices going. It doesn't matter how few were there. In fact, it used to be uh, this exclusive, and one had to go through all kinds of machinations to weed people out. Now people weed themselves out better than uh, I could imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a treat. You don't have to at all have all these labyrinthian disguises and, and, and disgusting practices and, uh, you know, oh, to discourage people so that only the cream would be there. Um, boy. They, they do a better job. It's a wonderful world for distraction. A million reasons not to do what is necessary. That's the nature of neurosis. We're talking about how integration and differentiation happen at the same time. Gravity integrates matter at the atomic level and makes stars, and stars, in the very process of their being, orphan energy, and it differentiates itself, slowly bubbling out to the surface. And when it gets to the surface, it doesn't stay there, but continues to differentiate and shines. So that starlight, sunlight, <laughs> sunlight, not this stuff, sunlight, is the universal denominator for the differential process, for consciousness, light, the mind of light. Sri Aurobindo did a wonderful little tiny book, The Mind of Light. And that consciousness is pure differential energy, pure differential energy. And does not integrate. Does not integrate. You say, well, how can that be? How can that be? And my answer now is that it's uh, mysterious. Just as light bubbles up through stars, and stars can be anything, there are gas bag stars. Timothy Ferris points out, if you read your book, there are gas bag stars so diffuse that air is thicker than the stars, than those kinds of stars. And yet they are stars. What does he say? There are stars smaller than the Earth and stars larger than the Earth's orbit. Antares, which is a pretty large red giant, if it were where Sol is, its surface would be out around the orbit of Mars. <laughs> so stars come in as many varieties as human beings. There are human beings, unique human beings, who are so radically different from anyone that you've ever met that gods come from all parts of the universe just to see the curiosity. When the historical Buddha was teaching, all kinds of metaphysical transcendent celestial creatures would come to listen in because they had never seen such a thing. Why? Because they belong to an integral aspect of the universe. They don't cross over. They don't transform. If they did, they wouldn't be what they are. They would be what we are. We cross over. And so we are very, very interesting and very precious because we inhabit uh, two realms that interpenetrate together in such a curious mysterious, paradoxical way, but never, ever do they 
smear each other. That's the word I wanted. Integration and differentiation never smear each other. You can complement them, put them in complementation so that they are ultra fine, ultra refined, so that to someone external observing, which is sort of Newtonian, <laughs> or someone who is participating in it, it would seem to them that this is all of one piece. And yet one can get to a refined enough level to be able to differentiate and see that they were not together at all. One can either integrate to the point of vanishing, or one can differentiate to the threshold of uh, all-inclusiveness. Pleroma. Either way, one outstrips, one exceeds the refined mulching together and can observe quite accurately, I mean accurately, to whatever tolerance one you, you imagine the toleration, the measurement you want to apply, and it can be not only met but exceeded. The exactness shows that they do not touch. We were talking last week about mutually exclusive polarities, and it's the fact that they are mutually exclusive that allows for polarized energy to be real. Otherwise, it wouldn't be real. What would happen is that otherwise you would get a constant, instant, short circuit that would never end. In order for polarity, in order for electromagnetic energy in a polarized way to be real and to work so that there can be matter, materia, they have to be totally, absolutely mutually exclusive. And that is the trigger that allows for their transformation into the complementation of oneness. Now, all of this is essential for our understanding of nature. There's no way that we can go one step beyond February Twelfth, Lincoln's birthday, 1994, without understanding that. There's no way whatsoever. And frankly, to make you feel better, anyone who's investing their hard-earned bucks in some other kind of education is throwing their money away. They're buying cotton candy made with uh, plastic fluff. There's not even any sugar in it. Nature, in this pristine, precarious wonderfulness, is the only place in which we can get traction so that action is real. To use the Greek term, pragmatos. And it is essential for us that prag pragmatos, when it occurs, is objectively real. That actions have the same level of objective reality that material has. And in order for actions to be as real as things, we have to understand that we have brought ourselves into a stage of the integration process where paradox characterizes the structural nature of what is objectively real. It has to. It needs to. And to prepare our character, not our consciousness. We're not going to talk about that till next year. And we don't have to worry about it. Consciousness already, because of its nature, deals with this very well. But character does not. Character tends to shy away from paradox, to ignore it, that it's not there, to justify it for some uh, uh, 
metaphysical reasons that are fictive, have nothing to do with it's there. We don't want to ignore, we don't want to put blinders on, and we don't want to have these kinds of other blinders that are reflections of metaphysical speculative fictions. We don't want to have any metaphysics, and we don't want to have any ignoring going on. And so right here, at the two-thirds point coming up in nature, we want to initiate and begin in a seminal way our whole concern, our next concern, with ritual. And so there are two things to do. Two projects. Mask making. Make two masks. One is a mask of something that comes in, and the other is a mask that's something that goes out. And I want you to make them roughly together. One is a mask of some food stuff, something you eat, something you drink, coffee, watermelon, honey, whatever. A mask of something from your diet. And we'll take a break and come back when the machines are ready. Let's come back from the break. Let's come back not, not right away to stars or persons. Let's come to Homer. You're either reading The Odyssey or Moby Dick. A feminine or a masculine journey which allows for the integration of the first year in the sense that either of these works will serve as a string to put the beads of episodes of events together to make a necklace of learning. If you're following Homer, if you're following the feminine journey, you would be at the beginning of book four in the Odyssey. The first four books of the Odyssey are the preliminary, the prelude, the overture to the Odyssey. It concerns Telemachus, the son of Odysseus. And so the first four books, the Telemachia, as it sometimes is called, is setting the stage. And with book five, Odysseus himself comes into play. So that Homer, in laying this journey, the feminine journey, <clears throat> shows us first the son before the man, the boy before the father. It's a woman's concern, it's a mother's concern. For the feminine journey will look to the son before it looks to the lover. Or to put it in the old way, looks to the son first before the father. Here's how book four begins. Two young Greeks, one the son of Nestor, the other the son of Odysseus, come into the palace of Menelaus, near Sparta, in the Peloponnese of Greece. And we get the introduction here with the men, and then in comes Helen, who has rejoined her husband Menelaus. Helen, who was the cause and start of the entire Trojan War. Here's the masculine setting for the entrance of Helen, the jewel of this particular episode. The they here are the two young men. They came into the cavernous hollow of Lacedaemon and made their way to the house of glorious Menelaus. They found him in his own house giving 
for many townsmen a wedding feast for his son and his stately daughter, the girl he was sending to the son of Achilles, breaker of battalions. For in Troy land first he had nodded his head to it and promised to give her, and now the gods were bringing to pass their marriage. So he was sending her on her way with horses and chariots to the famous city of the Myrmidons, where Neoptolemus was lord, and he brought Alector's daughter from Sparta to give powerful Megapenthes his grown son, born to him by a slave woman, by, because the gods gave no more children to Helen once she had borne her first and only child, the lovely Hermione, with the beauty of Aphrodite the Golden. And so that's the beginning and the setting. And here's the, just a few lines, the entrance of he Helen, emerging for the first time into the uh, Homeric uh, uh, epic ethos. While he was pondering these things in his heart and in his spirit, Helen came out from her fragrant high bed chamber looking like Artemis of the golden distaff. Adreste followed, setting the well-made chair for her in place. And the coverlet of soft wool was carried in by Alcipi. And Philo brought the silver work basket, which had been given by Alcendri, the wife of Polybos, who lived in Egyptian Thebes, where the greatest number of goods are stored in the houses. Polybios himself gave Menelaus two silver bathtubs and a pair of tripods and ten talents of gold, and apart from these his wife gave her own beautiful gifts to Helen. She gave her a golden distaff and a basket silver with wheels underneath, and the edges were done in gold. Philo, her maidservant, now brought it in and set it beside her, full of yarn that had been prepared for spinning. The distaff with the dark-colored wool was laid over the basket. Helen seated herself on the chair, and under her feet was a footstool. At once she spoke to her husband and questioned him about everything. Do we know, Menelaus, beloved of Zeus, who these men announce themselves as being? Who have come into our house now? Shall I be wrong, or am I speaking the truth? My heart tells me to speak, for I think I never saw such a likeness, neither in man nor woman, and wonder takes me as I look on him, as this man has a likeness to the son of the great-hearted Odysseus. And so Homer, and so the Odyssey, and the adventure continues. The journey continues. The Odyssey is a journey of light radiating and spreading out in a differential realization of the increasing context of what is real. It's a feminine mode that is characteristic in the integral process. Whereas the masculine mode of the integral process is markedly different. It's like Melville in Moby Dick. Its integration tends to relentlessly come together to 
one thing which is pushed to the point of penetrating through the whole horizon of record and leaving a hole, leaving an opening. It's a difference in mode, but it's the same process of integration. And the two weave their threads, weave their ways, all the way through the integral process. And so it's not just simply this kind of pulsating image of the heart that we began with today. Not simply coming together and going apart. They happen at the same time, and they happen in distinctive modes, and the modes are always paired. There are always pairs operating, pairs of processes, pairs of modes within the processes, so that if one is looking at the pattern of the real, there's a square of modes, there's a pair of processes. And because of the probabilities just on those factors, one comes up with a 2 times 4, one comes up with a noble eightfold quality. So that eightness characterizes whole in terms of the real. Eight. Eightness. <clears throat> what are the qualities in integration about differentiation? And I want to use a kind of a vocabulary which is essentially slopsistic, but uh, we can use it. In integration, differentiation is unconscious. Whereas in differentiation, integration is unconscious. The only time that those two processes are equally there is when both are accessible or inaccessible, either way. The ancient yogic way of conveying this, if we were in Rishikesh 5,000 years ago, we would use the breath process, the breathing process as the mode of understanding this. Integration is breathing in. Differentiation is breathing out. Just before you stop breathing in and you breathe out, there is a pause. Or, let's say, a threshold that can be made to be a pause. So that I go and stop and then exhale. Now, if I make the pause of equal length with the inhale and the exhale, I begin to notice that also, at the end of exhaling, there's another pause. So that breathing is like a four-part cycle. The breathing in has a certain quality. I can feel the air entering and kinesthetically the feeling in a body, a human body, of air coming in is that it swirls. And who knows why, but it feels like it swirls in a regular fashion, which in the Northern Hemisphere is a clockwise fashion. It's very natural in the Southern Hemisphere, but we don't have too many developed philosophies from Tierra del Fuego, but it swirls in a counterclockwise fashion. So if you're wild gaucho down on the pampas of Argen the Argentine, 
your yoga goes left-handed. <laughs> Which is why they're the way they are. <laughs> Their peace of mind is non-stop action. <laughs> They're very happy and very calm if they're at full speed. I spent a week with some Buenos Aires family people one time, and it was a pell-mell, as the English used to say. <laughs> when, pretend now we're back in Rishikesh, when Harappa and Mohenjo-daro were still cities, and the Indus River hadn't changed its course, and uh, none of this had happened, but we think about as history. When you breathe in and that swirls around, that motion, that movement, that movement is very characteristic of nature. The clockwise swirling of intake. Just as then the exhale is like the counterclockwise swirling. And that pulse of breath articulated by the punctuation of pause at both ends of the cycle. And if we set ourselves to balance the inhale and the exhale so that they are perfectly balanced, we can then focus our concentration in ourselves on the pause within or we could focus ourselves on the pause without. Could do it either way. And yoga, as it were, developed to focus on both of them at the same time. Simultaneity. But usually it's one or the other. Most of the healing yogas of Tibet uh, focus upon the uh, breath uh, cycle, the night and day cycle being uh, uh, equalized, whereas in India the predilection was to focus on the, um, on the presence of the pause, as it were. If you focus upon the inner pause and you become adept at that, I don't mean occult master adept, just that you become good at it, you can do it, more and more as that refines, one experiences that pause as a disappearing. And you find that your attentiveness, your physiological attentiveness to that particular pause, when it's successful, blanks out the physical world. Now, 5,000 years ago, it was very difficult to do this. Today, it's very easy to do this, and the problem is not to do this while you're driving. <laughs> A lot of evolution. And if you start thinking about something else, you already blank out. But if you go into a deep uh, samadhi on the freeway, uh, you won't care whether it's there or not. If you focus on the pause outside, you do not experience this, this disappearing, but you experience a kind of an oceanic allness as Aldous Huxley describes in the perennial philosophy, I think for Western readers, his description is reasonably one of the better. This quality, this quality of balance in terms of the, now that we're speaking about it, it's a metaphor of breathing, but if we were doing it, it wouldn't be a metaphor, it would be a ritual. The ritual of breathing, the ritual of breath. If we were aspirants 5,000 years ago in northern India, we would do this, but we're not. We come after a long development, a asymptotic jet takeoff rise in the skills of our spirit. And what was very good on the ground in Rishikesh 
does not serve us so well now that we're getting airborne at this tremendous thrust and we want to make sure we're going to be able to operate in that kind of environment, that kind of nature. And so instead of breathing, we're going to make masks. The food mask is breathing in, the feeling mask is breathing out. These are the two breaths. Make a mask of something from your food, something from your diet, and make a second mask of something, a feeling that you recognize in yourself. Put a face on that feeling. Put a face on that food. These two faces will be for us what the breath yoga would have been 5,000 years ago. And we're going to be able to use these two masks in a very special way. And once those masks are made, once we have those two faces, we're going to find that if you juxtapose those two faces in two different ways, two distinct different ways, if you have the two masks facing each other, you're going to have an interior focus. If you have the two masks facing out, you're going to have an exterior focus. But because our imagination does not carry to an exterior focus like that so well, we call an exterior threshold, a sphere. The standard English term by the late 20th century is a sphere. So a sphere of influence. But because these two masks come from our actual livingness, it's like your walk. Your walk characterizes the nature of your livingness, where you actually live, how you live, how you are. Everything that is important in that is truthfully bound and tied, tied like it with a bow, not with a knot, but tied with a bow, tied as a present. Even the term is beautiful. If you tie something with a bow, it's tying presents as a present, which can be opened, on, opened up later on. And you will open this in the history section of the second year. So you're making a present for your future self. And part of our education is to learn the courtesy of wrapping up gifts to our future self and making sure we do as good a job as we can and that we give these episodes, these experiences to our future self. Bestow is the English term for that kind of activity. Bestow upon our future self the care of our operation now. This is part of the courtesy of a wisdom learning. It gets completely skewed off if you make these presents for the teacher. Just to be cruel about it, the teacher doesn't need it. So you're making these presents not to come up to an approval level of some pseudo-parental authority, teacher, master, adept. No. That's almost a poetic line, right? <laughs> But these are gifts to your future development and a quality of your future development that's going to be a problem. It cannot help but be a problem because we are born into a matrix that's in a very crucial stage now where history is our problem. <laughs> history is the problem of the 20th century. And we are choking to death in the fact that we can't cough it up and we can't swallow it. So these two masks, now you can make them in either order. I would suggest trying to make them together. But the important thing is that you actually do it. It doesn't matter how sloppy the masks are, how junky, how well you do them. All that is real that matters is that you do do them. 
Now, there have been some very lovely, sophisticated people who've prided themselves in having gone through this educational process who never made masks. And what can I say? Nothing after that was real. They were just simply tuning in some kind of a visual channel. With all apologies to those that have access only through a videotape, I'm really here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a videotape being run from some kiosk elsewhere. I know, I pulled all those plugs, I'm still here. So this quality of these two masks is like our breathing, it's like a cycle, it's integration and exhaling, differentiation. And one of the qualities in nature is that stars breathe and they exhale light and they inhale gravity. Got it? Gotcha? When stars breathe, they inhale gravity and they exhale light. And when they're inhaling, when they're inhaling gravity, the energy in electrons is particle-like. And when they're exhaling, the energy is wave-like. But this pair particle wave occur in an ironic ambidexterity. <laughs> so that when the wave of energy comes into an integration process venue, it acts again as if it were a particle. But as soon as it participates in a radiant, radial, radiational, differential process, it is again an energy. So that sunlight shining upon a leaf, the energy of that light from the sun participates in that photosynthesis process in a chemical way, as if it were particles. But there is a certain transformation of the plant called the flowering, <laughs> and the flower exudes that energy again. And it's like the fragrance of a flower starts off as particles, but as soon as it enters into a conscious being's proximity, the particles of the fragrance of the plant transform and become energy waves. And one says, this rose smells sweet. It is we, in our conscious mode, who have made the sweetness, the energy, out of the flower. It's like the physics of reality. This is actually what happens. So that human beings have understood more or less how this happens, and the science of making perfumes has come up. Originally based on floral, and a late, later going into spices and all kinds of other things, but making the characteristics of the energy delight of fragrance where there were no actual plant particles. Now our education is very much like this kind of uh, 
perfuming. Perfuming. We want to have character really integrated, but a character in its integration, in its particle thereness, that has the perfume of intelligence about it. And that's why I'm keeping it mixed all the way through and not compartmentalizing it. Because an education that compartmentalizes uh, makes a very bitter, supercilious critics out of children. And uh, they resent this because it dices up the very substance of their experience and they become neurotically inclined killers by the time they're adolescents just out of the sheer process of mismanaging energy. And there's plenty of that to go around now. We don't need to do that anymore. Question, if this is so great and so smart, how come it isn't out there? Answer, uh, it's new, it will be out there. It'll do its work. Now one of the peculiar things about differentiation is that differentiation commutes. It's a mathematical term. Both differentiation and averaging commute. That is to say, whatever happens actually in a differential mode, in a differential process, is able to be um, factored into and shared in the relational, measurable, actuality of any other process that it comes into contact with. The mathematical principle of commutation, commuting, commutation, is in reciprocity. I give this, you give that. And so reciprocity is one of the characterizations of the ritual level of human cultural wiseness. Good rituals not only teach, but embody reciprocity. One of the most uh, large-scale, easy-to-understand characteristic Rituals as the uh, Northwest uh, um, United States, uh, Canada, uh, Indian potlatch. The giveaway. And the whole thing with the potlatch is to give away as much as you can. And one would say, well, then you would have nothing. Well, yes, but uh, next week somebody else is going to give away. And, and this way there's a distribution by commuting on the principle of reciprocity that sustains everyone. Notice here that if the process is not ongoing, it falls apart immediately. <laughs> that its seal, it's the ancient magical way of making sure that it's there, the seal is that it continues. <laughs> it's Continuance is the only insurance and guarantee that it is real. And so the number one interest of a tradition, of a culture, is to ensure, to seal it, that it's ongoing. This brings into play the gravitas of the character, the dependability of the culture, but it also ties the situation in such a way that the bows tend to become smaller and smaller and approximate more and more knots. <laughs> and when the bonus crosses a thir certain threshold and becomes like a knot, then the culture becomes freeze-dried. The tradition becomes stifling. And so there has to be a counter-movement built in to the very structure of the process of the tradition so that that doesn't happen. It would happen very quickly. Uh, ancient uh, wisdom uh, put it at about uh, 10 generations. 
given the best of intentions, the wisest of individuals, in about 10 generations, it runs itself into a hole, into a knot. And so you have to build in wild cards into the deck so that that doesn't happen. It's the place of the fool or the trickster or whatever it is in the ritual process. You always have to have that. And we'll take a look at that when we get into ritual more. The trickster, the fool, the wise madman inhabits the spaces and not the things. <laughs> like the Taoist butcher, he cuts in between things and never touching anything never needs, uh, never dulls and never needs sharpening. Nature is very, very wise in that nature as a matrix of change operates constantly with this going on. So that as long as human beings looked at things they did not understand, they were not able to work with nature. And the very first object, the very first thing in nature that showed our forebearers, I use the term very loosely because they were not all that much like us, it was a long time ago, seven or eight hundred thousand years ago, they discovered that the first object that refuses to stay put is fire. And when you begin working with fire, Objectively, you realize that fire as an object has such a scintillating quality, very difficult to contain, so that the only way to carry fire objectively is to carry it in its seminea, in its seed. And the earliest way of making fire, because there were no matches, and there were certainly no gas ranges, there were no blow torches, fire was made by friction. <laughs> by taking a dowel and putting it into a surface that has a cavity, a depression, and the friction of that dowel in that cavity with a little bit of tinder makes fire so that one then had two, two things, two aspects that together would make fire. You had the, you had the, uh, the dowel which was familiar to them because it was the shaft of the arrow and in fact, the bow that shoots the arrow is exactly the right instrument to use to make the dowel go, to have its friction with one change. You don't put the arrow, the dowel, with its end on the bowstring, but you loop the bowstring once around the dowel. And you find that in a practical way, if you do this, that you have to loop the bowstring uh, about a third of the way from one end of the dowel. It's the same principle as throwing a spear or javelin. If you're going to throw it, uh, your power comes from about two-thirds back from the front. And the more pressure you can put on that particular focus uh, at any given instant, the more penetrating power the spear has. The same thing in making fire. So that the bow that would shoot the arrow is a bow then that could make this uh, uh, friction. So you would carry, but if you have a point on the arrow, it doesn't make that much friction. So you have to have an arrow that doesn't have a point. So notice that these little modifications and transformations take a weapon and make it into a tool. But notice the metaphor here between male and female. The dowel and the cavity in the plane. 
that both together make the friction that is the seed of fire, and that this is the only way in which objectively to carry fire around. Yes, you can have a torch, but after two or three years, no matter how good a torch you make, they go out, <laughs> even after two or three days. So carrying fire, especially as the hidden seed in shaped wood, what kind of shape? Two pieces of wood that are shaped to go together, to meet together. A plane that has a receptivity for the dowel. It's the principle by which post and beam architecture takes place. <laughs> it's very primordial. <laughs> it's like a primordial structure. This structure is an index into the, the guarantee that certain ritual actions are going to work. One of the principles in building used to be to square it. If you have it squared, if you have your post and beam squared, then you've, you've got it. And in order to make sure that the square is relational to the site, then you have a plumb bob. So with the plumb bob and the square, you're able to build true. All of these metaphors, all of this kind of language was a half million years ago, not understood consciously, but understood increasingly implicitly hidden in the very act of being able to make fire. And so all the valuation which we can consciously differentiate out of this now was all enfolded in a hidden, unconscious, as it were, way in the mystery of carrying the seed of fire around that's in the sticks in the stick and in the plane. But notice here that that stick and that plane are already an adaptation. That friction is already an adaptation. That even earlier than that, maybe a million years ago, one understood that fire can be made by flint, by sparking. So there are, are primordial models, as it were, of the way in which the hidden reality of the world was made accessible through certain ritual implements, tools. So that tools, we will find, tools are a coming out of the matrix of nature into the objectivity of action. And tools are like the gears that make action have a pragmatic, cinching quality of objectivity. It can be called implements. Later on, perhaps it's better to call them implements. But tools is, is the better word. When a creature begins tool making, they, we will come to experience this, they have already opened up a gap between themselves and their nature. And that gap is a place where wild energy lives. It lives in the gap. And if you have the tool, the object, the energy from that gap is in that tool. And so the tool becomes charged, charged with a mana, with an energy. Where does that energy come from? Not from superstition. <laughs> That's a Victorian anthropological misnomer. There's no superstition at all. Half million years ago, our ancestors were not superstitious at all. They knew that there is a magical power, that it comes somewhere be in emerging from nature, 
You don't have to emerge very far, just a hair's breadth, really, and already the magic is there. The magic that's in the tension, and so the tension of separation produces an energy which will go to one pole or the other. If it goes to the object, then the object has it. But if you bring the object closer in proximity to nature again, you can get the energy to jump from the object back into nature. So there were whole yogas that were developed once upon a time, a long time ago, of bringing one's body as an object back into the mysteriousness of nature and doing it in such a graduated way that you just barely skimmed the surface of nature and the energia of your body went back into nature and left you temporarily no energy whatsoever. Oddly enough, one didn't disappear or collapse. And very mysterious uh, qualities would come out. What mysterious quality? Consciousness. Pure consciousness came out. Because the true origin of differentiation is in a zero base reality. Now, that's very complex, and it takes a long time to even believe that that is true, much less to work with it. But what is important to us in our education right now is that our sense of nature is to appreciate that stars and human beings have a similar cycle, that the cycle has both the gentle bubbling up pressure radiation pressure of light as energy being released from the very process that's there because gravity is bringing it into a fusion proximity. And that both these are happening at the same time. And if it happens on a large scale of a gas field, you have a star. And if it happens on the scale of this kind of animate uh, creature, then you have a human being. Our humanness is bound up in having both these processes going on more or less in some kind of ratio. Perhaps not balance. It's rare to meet anyone who's even 90% balanced. But close enough that one can be in the picture, be in the game. But our attentiveness our attention quality, because of the kind of culture and education we came from, is only able to handle um, the objective half of that with any kind of comfort. And because I'm trying to teach in a way which exceeds that limitation by several degrees of several powers of dimension, the assignment about the mask is something that you should begin now, even though we're still in nature. It's as simple as this. When you go home tonight, not this noon, but tonight, why don't you take as a suggestion that the first food that you reach for or think about is what should be your mask? Whatever it is, you can say, well, that's accidental. Well, yes, if it were just that single incident, it would have the probability of accident. But by pursuing it and carrying it on into this educational process, you will transform the chance nature of that into change. It doesn't matter what chance it was, it would transform into a change dimension. And with change, we can modulate it. And in modulation, we can bring it to a threshold of translation. And we can translate it out of its seminaria as just randomness 
into a realization of purpose. It's not something we have to understand. It's just something to do. And if we do it together, if we do this together, if we share this together, we will make here in this situation a mini culture. It's not going to interfere with whatever culture you're familiar with in your ordinary life. But we will make a mini culture which will be attuned to the ancient wisdom tradition. And because the ancient wisdom tradition was specifically excellent at transforming cultures into civilizations, we will find ourselves eventually, towards the end of the way, year, becoming civilized in a very classic way. And it doesn't matter where you, your beginning is. It doesn't matter how much you understand it or don't understand it. None of those things are true indexes to success. If you want to put it in terms of success, the fact that you do it is your seal and your promise, your guarantee. Not from me, f from the way things are. I wanted to talk a little bit about dimension, and I think maybe um, let's do this. Try and get a copy of Galaxies, and when you get to Galaxies, there's a section that starts after the Crab Nebula photograph. And it starts on page 52, I believe. Yeah, 52. It's called Black Holes. Try to begin from page 52 on Black Holes and try to read into the next section, which is called The Local Group of Galaxies, Section 2 of Galaxies. In other words, the page and a half on Black Holes as a prelude to reading about the local group of galaxies. The reason is this. Not only do persons and stars share a reality cycle, but that galaxies share it with us. It's a very peculiar thing. Very, very peculiar. That in the scale of the universe, stars are a median point. They're like a focal balance point in between people and galaxies. Just like man is a focal point in between atoms and galaxies. And once one gets the proportions, once one gets the proportions, the geometry of learning becomes much easier. Because it's a dimensionality, it's a measurable, imaginative structuring that's not based on images, but based upon sense of proportion. It attunes us away from the superstitious pictures to the geometric uh, appreciation. One thinks that beauty is uh, in the images, but beauty really is in the proportion. It seems questionable and arguable, but beauty actually is in the proportions. So let's try and make that uh, a part of our education. What are we going to do now? You're going to do two things. You're going to you're going to make two masks. And tonight, whatever you drink or eat first, use that as a suggestion. Just. Don't even think about it, but just be aware when it happens. You know, you can, if you're in this process, you can set your mind and your mind will remind you. The so-called unconscious mind is very alert. It's deeper than even hypnotic suggestion. If you need images, you're hypnotized that you're going to remember that if you reach for an orange, you're going to say, ah, that ah, probably more elegant than my awe, is the beginning of a sense of wonder, a seed, a semenea, 
of the unfolding geometry of the proportional relationality that we will use to articulate our educational process. And because it will be distinctively yours, you will appropriate this whole process for yourself more and more and view me more and more as just another item in the enrichment of your own field of learning. And that's the way a teacher should be. A teacher should eventually be just, a, just an item in your field of inquiry and not at all the structure which you're dependent upon. To sort of mocking my previous um, uh, felon, instead of uh, me having a bunch of Rolls Royces lined up, you should all be driving Rolls Royces. <laughs> okay? Pink ones, powder blue ones. <laughs> <laughs>